Okay, uh, thank you everybody for joining today. And this is going to be the last and final class. This will be discussing about the rules, uh, the configuration, and how to perform incident response and analysis in IBM QRadar and how to do a manual analysis with terms of verifying logs, checking logs, uh, evaluating false positives. How do you analyze an incident in terms of incident uh, activities that has been identified? So to start off with this uh, session, so I hope that most of you are aware of QRadar so far. So I know like everybody are completely aware of QRadar and how it functions. Can somebody answer if you don't mind? At least Steven is typing. Anybody has any clarifications or doubts about the SIEM or the functionalities or how it operates or how it works? Okay, Steven says he's spending with few topics. Okay, the architecture. Okay, uh, thanks Steven for getting that up. Anybody has any other concerns about uh, the uh, architecture or anything else? That I should be aware of. If you have any other things that I should be clarifying today, because uh, I don't think that uh, in this class this might take one or two hours, but we are intending to complete all the things that has been pending and so that it doesn't get any problem in future, so you don't miss out on anything. So if, you, if anybody needs anything, feel free to ask or uh, let me know how it works, okay? Uh, Chevy says it's about the dashboard. Anybody else? Fine. So I got two things. So I understood one thing like I could have jumped directly into rules and configurations uh, and give you an overview. And then also I can explain you about the architecture and the dashboards. The reason why I am starting with the rules first is like, you know, the systems are which we are configuring consumes a lot of space and resource. So once we are out of it, it's hard to get them back online or uh, we have to troubleshoot all over again because these resources are high resource. I mean, these softwares and systems, you have to run multiple VMs to do it. So uh, I keep a note on things that we are you know discussing right now about the dashboards and other things, and I'm going to cover it in two different ways. OK, uh, the one way which I'm going to cover is to ensure that, you know, uh, if there are any you know topics that is pending so let me cover off the rules first and i'll show how the rules operate in qradar and what is the magnitude and other details so that's the core concepts that we have for understanding rules like what is the magnitude uh, what is the credibility and uh, how does the rules actually measured in terms of this and uh, you have different documents for explaining like how are these rules documented and uh, followed and how it's measured in terms of a scoring system Okay, fine. Uh, let me go ahead and start off with this, and I'll take you through the rules overview and then how it functions and how the rules are installed or configured and how it uh, actually operates. So, for this, we refer back to the IBM QRADA table of contents guide and this thing I will share it across right now on the screen. One second, uh, incident overview app. Okay, I've started sharing the screen, so hope it is visible right now. I have opened two apps. So this is the IBM Knowledge Center. So most of the things which I would say or uh, I'm going to point out is through the Knowledge Center so that it, you, it represents uh, the IBM's authentic things. But for reference, I will use something called uh, solar winds, which is easier to understand, which is not quite complex. It's again an SIM solution. You no need to worry whether it is uh, helpful or not. It is the same SIM solution, but the features, the configurations are quite less compared to your QRadar, and it makes everything simple to understand and uh, how helpful it will be. You will understand once you see the dashboard because IBM's dashboard you need to configure as one of them has how to you know have the configuration of dashboard and other things. I'll get to that point as well. So I'll start with the, the QRadar rules and you know the scoring systems and other things. 
So what are basically the QRADAR rules that we were discussing? So the rules are nothing but the test cases or use case events that has been created from a layman language, from a normal analysis in terms of system understanding, uh, what you say, the definitions. Okay, a rule create can rules create by using and or or combinations. Okay, with the you can use existing rule sets to uh, create the new rules or you can use pre-existing rules that is created or you can use rules created by somebody for the curator and you have something called IBM app exchange where you get all this intelligence and uh, information about the rules that you have. So for creating a custom rule, uh, you need some understanding how the basic rule works first. Okay, how the events flow, how detects false positive, how to run anomaly detection rules are there, uh, like what are the building blocks of it? How do you evaluate them? How do you give them the magnitude, credibility and other things? So. I'm going to take you through the IBM dashboard first since it's uh, theoretical. It will take quite a long time. So right now, whatever you see on the screen, this is a typical IBM dashboard. OK, and if you see any any offense, OK, you take, for example, if you click on an offense or a suspicious activity, you have uh, three things that is mentioned or specified over here for measuring the criticality. So the one thing is the, the relevance, the severity and credibility. So how many of you know what is the relevance, the severity and the credibility? How uh, I mean your understanding about it? Because I can just, you know, show it right here itself. But I want to know and listen to you because it should be interactive, not that I'm giving a lecture, but I want to understand your uh, overview about these things. Anybody? Uh -huh. Any? Who is there? Anybody? You can you can unmute and I can answer. There is no restriction about that. Okay. <clears throat> Since nobody is answering. Let me uh, go ahead and you know take you through this. OK, what does relevance, credibility and severity mean? What is IBM QRADAR magnitude that you are seeing right here on the uh, VM or the dashboard of this machine? Uh, what is it? OK, this is minimized, fine. OK, if you see for the IBM uh, prioritization and indexing, relevance determines the impact of the offense on your network. For example, if the port is open, the relevance is high. Credibility indica indicates the integrity of the offense as determined by the credibility rating that is configured in the log source. Credibility increases as multiple sources report the same event. Severity indicates the level of threat that a source possess in relation to how prepared the destination is for the attack. And these things overall depends on the number of log sources, the age of the offense, the number of event flows, weight of the asset. So this is a patented authentic information that is of the IBM that is restricted to IBM itself. And it is not revealed to us because uh, the information which you're seeing on the screen, right, about the curator offense, so these calculations are quite determined based on the event flow or the categories that has been assigned, like the description, if you see the source IPs, Another thing. So I will break it up. Okay, before you do a custom rule. Okay, I will sum it up and I'll make it more simpler than this language. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Now let me stop this one. Okay, here. You have relevance. You have credibility, you have severity. So to use an existing rule, these things are already pre-configured. Overall of all these things will constitute your, your magnitude, which is average of all three. Of R, C, yes. So if you take average of relevance, credibility and severity, that will give your magnitude. Okay, now, Severity is quite simple to understand it based on the offense or indicates the threat that it possesses, something like a password attack that is a 
uh, DOS attack, there's a brute force attack. So based on this, perhaps I can say for a brute force attack, the severity, it will be seven. So you have from one to 10, you can assign. Uh, so I will assign uh, zero to 10 also. I can assign 10 for the severity if that is a brute force attack that is happening. Credibility is nothing but integrity of the offense. That means how many log sources will report the same event. That means if I go to the uh, curator offense list and if you see there are five events and zero flows. So because of this, the severity is five. I mean, uh, the, sorry, not the severity. The credibility is depending on that. That is credibility is three because the number of events saying about this attack is quite less or it might also be understood that this event has occurred on only one particular system because it's not a organization weight attack that is happening. It's a target attack or a suspicious attack happening on an internal network. So if you see what is the source IP and the destination IP, they both are same. OK, for example, this covers your incident analysis as well while I'm saying. So if you see the source IP and the destination IP are same, that means the attack is originated on the system in the system itself. It is not from somewhere else. If a brute force is happening or a DOS attack is happening, you will see another uh, machine's IP address which is targeting on this system so that you will see that attack has a major uh, severity. So the reason why here the severity is less is because the attack has happened on the machine itself and there is no other external IP address from where the attack has been originated. You see the time frame, time length, when it happened, what activity it has been performed. And if you go a little bit in depth, it will give you information about user account added, user account deleted. That has been identified as suspicious activity. On which machine? It's on the technical, uh, you know, uh, this is the machine which I have, the technical analyst machine. I'll just show it. And after that, it's append on October 28th, that is uh, 2020. User account added, user account deleted, and what is the time frames? And username, syslocals. And this again has its own magnitude, its own relevance and its own credibility. So if you see every rule or every event has its own magnitude. So average of these three is what they consider as a severity magnitude. So collection of these things, average of these things will become your offense score. So offense score is made up of the di distributed number of events. So in each event, again, you will have a particular, uh, what you say, the relevant severity, everything. So this is a calculated risk or a uh, incident identification that has been done from Curadar, which emphasizes or which overpowers its capability of determining whether an attack is a false positive or a true positive. So what happens now, because of this, I had like, say, uh, I had only five events. So my credibility is quite three because I don't have much logs reporting the same offense or same uh, event happening on multiple machines. The IP address and the source address, destination address, it's all same. So credibility is quite less. Now my relevance. Relevance is nothing but what is the, uh, what do you say, uh, outcome of this activity or what is the issue from activity if I want to show this in relevance. It says that uh, in the impact of the offense that has happened on your network. So whether the impact is nothing but the port is open, but here since an activity is adding a user account, deleting a user account and the destination IP address is local if you see here. So my relevance is eight because there is an impact already happened. That means account created and already deleted. So they kept the relevance at eight. So anybody over there, can you just combine these three, 10 plus three plus eight, average of all these three, what is the score? Uh, if you want, I can use a calculator, but uh, see, uh, as I'm saying again, uh, it's an interactive thing. You got to be interactive. If you guys don't answer even, I won't understand whether the things are getting into your, uh, you know, it's able to understand or not. So that's, that's it. Eight plus three plus, 10 divided by 3. What is it? Hey, sorry, it's not the average. Anybody over there? Can you just calculate the average of 10, 3, 8? Oh, sorry, not 5. Where is the severity? Is 5 for it? Yeah. Hello? Guys, uh, are you guys anybody texting in the screen or something? I'm sorry about that, but I'm not able to see the conversation. Yes. Team? Anybody? Hello? Yes, tell me. You want an uh, average, right? Yeah, just the average. Yeah, 5.3. Okay, then 
what should be the magnitude of this in terms of f uh, 5.3 so let's see the offense score what is the magnitude that they have assigned to this score okay what is this magnitude if you see here six yeah so 5.3 is approximately they consider as magnitude six and according to their calculation okay based on this calculation the magnitude six with the relevance or uh, of eight value they consider this to be an offense with a magnitude of impact six so that means it's not a major impact it might be a light impact because if you see the magnitude that it's showing is in orange it's not like it's showing in red or something like that because each and everything is measured over here and it has a particular value if it exceeds so something about seven or eight it turns into red because it's a critical one the magnitude will turn red and if it's something less it will be medium and if it is low it will not even show it as an offense so that's how the magnitude work and each ever each and every offense has its own set of rules and each and every rule again has relevance severity and credibility understood right yes okay so in this offense, if you go, you will see the list of uh, events happening, when it happened, what is the number of events, flows. And there is one more field at the bottom that is quite important and interesting. Annotations. Annotations are series of events that happens over, uh, over the flow. Okay, if you see here, the first thing I've mentioning, the source IP currently has one other uh, active source on the network. The source attempted attack more hosts on the network are known to exist so these are like descriptions of the attack that has been happening or the offense that has been created so if you see cre rule description suspicious activity determined that's the rule that got triggered and suspicious activity followed by endpoint administration again it's about a task that is a user account deleted or created now where do i find these rules which is creating me these you know uh, suspicious activity events in my system because whatever i'm getting is just a flow of events right it's multiple events are coming into my system and it is picked up by this threat intelligence. It's grouping them together and it's saying it's a suspicious activity. But how does it happen? Now, if I go for log if history, right? If you see, there is quite a lot of information flowing into my system. And this is the flow of events. So this is the event count. If the same event happens multiple times, the count will increase. If the same event is happening uniquely, it will remain one. So this is the event count. So this log source, where, time, everything, it will get captured. Once clubbing together the flow of these events, an offense will get generated. Now, apart from this, what all can I check in terms of uh, my network activity, my assets? So, this is a system which I have connected 57.4. So, that's the system which I'm working on right now, uh, the Linux machine. Sorry to interrupt you, Iman one. I guess uh -huh. she, wants to ask, uh, she wants to ask something. He raised his hand. Oh, okay. Yes, please. Uh, you are texting there? Uh, see, uh, please go ahead. Hi, how are you? Yeah, please ask me. Yes, I want to ask something. Yeah, please go ahead. So, if you are if you are building your rule from scratch, how do you give the magnitude and uh, and uh, the severity? Mm -hmm. How do you know that you must give three or it's curator itself that gives automatically? Okay, uh, to answer this question, curator has already done that. Okay, and we are leveraging the existing rules that is present. Okay. So in software development and other things, you would have heard the concept of inheritance. So Curada is quite an old tool in the industry. They are not new. So what they did is for each and every event, they already scored and measured it. So when you create a rule, right, it takes the uh, uh, some of all those events that is clubbed together and it will give you the offense result. So offense is triggered based on the rules that you are creating. So I'll show you how. Uh, for this, I'll go to this admin tab. Okay. Now, if I want to have uh, this log sources, log extensions, these are all the things. But if I want to go particularly target on uh, the rules that I have or particular rules that I want to check, there is one option where you can uh, group this. One second. Yeah, I'll just show it. Sorry for this. Uh, it's taking some time. It's not loading fast.
this is So this is like uh, the rules that we have already installed or configured and these rules are something that I've added from uh, Linux Mitre and Curator things. Okay. Okay, I'll download one package from here so that I can tell you how these rules would look like, how it's configured, how it works, okay? Now, tell me a famous vulnerability which you feel that you know, your curad R or your SIM should be able to identify. Any one thing you can pick up. Any one vulnerability or uh, one use case or anything that you are well aware of. Okay, I can I can see the, the, the rules that you are showing us. Let's say I want to create a, a crawling account. So uh -huh. where the crawling account will fall on this use case? OK, no, I'll uh, get to that point. The reason is right uh, if I if I jump directly to that, right? I can open that. I can create the rule. I can show you the list of events. But the problem is it will take some time for me to pick it up and, you know. Uh, explain from the scratch. Uh, if I go to these rules, this is the rules tab which I'm going right now. OK, now you have something called enable true or not. Now, if I want to go ahead and check each rule or if I want to go for editing that, there is already pre-existing rules predefined inside the curator, something like this. OK, these are something like Anamlis, uh, Endpoint, Linux, Mac, everything is grouped under them. And there is a rule trigger. If you see a rule trigger for critical files directory, something, some changes have been done. Uh, I'll just okay. show you. You'll get an idea because it goes deeper and deeper. Uh, let me open that. OK, now if I want to open it. Now mm -hmm. I want to create new rule. What I'll do is for now I'll create an existing rule. I'll take an existing rule and create out of it. But I want to show first how it works in uh, solar winds. But yeah, let's let's give it a try. You will get the complexity of this. Then I'll go with the solar wind. So you'll understand why I have parked it up. Why I didn't jump into this directly. Now I open the rule wizard. OK, you can click on this. You don't have to. I mean, since I know it or else you can go step by step to understand how it works. Now I talked about your credibility magnitude and all right. I will show you why it is important. Now, if you want to choose a source from where you want to the rule to generate, you can either click on offenses, use the pre-existing offenses, or you can click on events or flows. By understanding the events and flows, you can still create an uh, you know the rule. So you wanted to create from a particular event, right? Or you want to create it from a pre-existing offenses? Okay. Which one you want to pick? I mean, you can choose. You can new, let me know. New events. New events. I right. want. Okay. I want. I want a new one. Yeah. Okay. Fine. So I am saying, if you pick events and flows also, it again picks up from the pre-existing. The reason is, this is quite simple. This is a completely architectured thing, IBM Curada, right? They have a standard. You cannot deviate from their existing standard. Now you see, this is a sample for creating a new rule out of the events and flows. The rule wizard, right? Now you have various test groups. So what is a test group? Now you have something like uh, you have all the ports, uh, IP addresses, host profile tests, functionalities, Everything is considered. Now you want to bring in something inside the rule. You have to add them. This is not something you can write from a normal statement. You have to add from the pre-existing statements. 
now if you see when the computer is on the local network is one of the following networks okay when the destination network is one of the following networks if ip protocol is from the following protocols so this is something you have to uh, add one by one and you have to write from this event so if i for example if i want to say if the destination port or the source port is so and so then you have to trigger me an alert now i have just have to click on this okay now it says the enter rule name here it says that whether what rule you want to create this i can say this is the inbound uh, rdp fine okay and the local system and the source port is one of the following ports i click on the port and i want to choose the port is 3389 that is the rdp port right now i added it submit now here it will automatically show me in the rule and okay if the system is local system okay or a global system and the source port uh, is one of the following from 3389 or if you want the destination port to be one of them, you just click on this, it will add. Okay. Now, again, and when the destination port is one of the following, again, I want to add 3389. Okay. Now, if you don't want to add this, you want to just remove this, right? Now, you want to add an IP address. You keep it or you just remove it and you save where is the source IP. And the IP protocol and the source IP, yeah, yeah, here it is. Now, if you want a particular IP address to target, okay, say for example, you have an IP address of 192, 168, 1.1. This is a sample I'm showing can, you. Can I ask something regarding? Yeah, please. I mm -hmm. wanted to ask regarding that RTP. So let's say. Let's say you are trying to build a, a use case on that RTP. So you want three fade log, uh, RTP sessions followed by successful one in five minutes. So how is that possible to create that uh, use case? Okay, first you need to understand the use case. Without understanding use case, you can't use these statement, statements, right? There are quite a lot of uh, statements. The greater than, lesser than, you can point out a geographic location also. For example, you want to block China or you want to understand the logs coming out of China. Just click on this tab and add the geolocation region from where actually the attack is happening. Now, I'm saying this 3389, I'm deleting that. I'm saying if the destination port is 3389, that is from an originating region, yeah. and when the source is located in a particular geographic location, you name the country where you want to monitor, you just add that country name and it automatically detects that. So you see here, you have regions. Africa, Asia. Now I go for Asia. Now, for example, Azerbaijan is waging a war. You know that, right? Azerbaijan, Armenia, they are under war uh, with Armenia. And you want to target, if your country is also targeted by Azerbaijan, add it, add it, submit. You see, when the destination port is 3389 yes. and the source located is at the uh, Azerbaijan, that means you are trying to identify whether the source from where this is happening or the source of the uh, uh, the network is from Azerbaijan and they are trying to communicate through port 3389, they establish a connection, you get an alert. So you have to choose in one of the members which member you want to add this rule to, whether it's an anomaly, asset reconciliation, execution, it's a botnet, it's a compliance, it's a DOS, it's an endpoint, what group you want to add this rule into. This is called rule event addition. You are only creating a rule for a particular event. Got it, right? If I say, for example, this is a, somebody is doing a recon and they are not doing on the port 3389, they're doing it on all the ports. Okay, say, now that you want 22. to put this. Yeah. This is completely you your me? choice. However, you want Hello. to configure. Yeah. I'm all, am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just have one okay, question. The, so, the, uh, please, guys, one by one, one by one. Sorry. Uh, you go ahead. Oh, okay. I just wanted to see, like, w uh, I can see you are creating that use case for, for RTP and then the country that you want to monitor. But my mm -hmm. question now is that when you want to see, like, uh, let's say someone is trying to RTP on your environment and then fi failed three times and then followed by successful in five minutes. So I want to see that kind of, of, of a use case. Like, how do you ah. specify the time? Like, if oh, one event, like, was, was failing and then eventually was successful. Okay. Now I have to dig through this because you are saying this is not an event, this is an offense. The reason is the offense consists of multiple events. 
you are saying there is three fa failure attempts one successful attempt and the user gained the access right yes okay so as per you there are three unsuccessful attempts yes followed by one successful one successful attempt in five, in five minutes and time is within five within five minutes okay so yes. we will take your root configuration in curadr and i'll explain you where you can add this but you can't add this in an event because event is nothing but one in one activity that is happening at a time so you can't bring it under the uh, event at all so i'll cancel this so that i'll take you through the offense tab understood right oh okay. hello now i'll okay. go to actions now i want a new rule okay i want to create a new offense rule Okay, now if I see in the offense rule, I got all the building blocks that I need here and I have a list of rule names. Okay, now if you don't want to go through the entire list adding one by one, okay, then you have to mention here what you want to apply. For example, if I want to check for the filter, uh, okay, invalid. Oh, sorry now i want invalid login attempt okay login hello hello yes yeah i have only one question regarding yeah, the previous uh, that we rule created so you created rule for only uh, you mention only one port number specific port number right either mm -hmm. you can uh, mention all port my question is if i want to uh, mention specific series like from 3500 to 4000 whatever mm -hmm. the range is can you do it in one rule or uh, do you have to go for multiples Ah, sorry, can you repeat that? Sorry, I didn't get So, it. you mentioned the port number in the rule you previously created. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, in that you mentioned one port number only. Either you can, uh, you are showing that you can mention all ports, right? Yes, yes, we can mention yeah. all ports. Yeah, it's not so an issue. Michael, you can add Michael, as many ports as you want. Yeah, so my question is if I want to add a series of port number, mm -hmm. is there a way to do it or do we have yes, to create separate rule for it? No, no, no. You just have to add. You have to just keep on adding it. That's it. Okay. I have to manually add it, right? Everybody. Yes, yes. Or you can uh, copy paste it. Okay. Okay. That's also fine. Uh, you wanted the port details, right? Let me see. This is, this is the port. One second. I'll stick to the use case scenario, but I'll do that also. Thanks. Yeah. Now I took the IP ports test. Okay, that was one in the event configuration. This is an offense, so that's the reason I'm not getting it. So, uh, sorry for it. Let me show you that one itself. Again, I have to come back and then Uh, why is not coming? Okay, you wanted about the ports. Like, is one of the following ports is or uh, it consists of all the ports. So, if you say any one of the following ports, then you just have to click on it, click on the ports, then you just keep on adding it. Like 22, 3389, 80, 21, just add all of them. Okay. Submit. You see? It automatically came in. It's if it triggers any one of the following port also, it triggers the event. Got it, right? Got it, got it. Okay. Now I delete this because I can I should stick to the use case that he has given. Uh, so it's three unsuccessful attempts. So I'm looking at the login. Uh, in where?
okay when the events had not been did when the none of these rules in this match okay this is the one i can try when at least when at least these many how many three three events are seen with the same event property uh, event property is invalid access not clearing trigger this is one minute with him five minutes these rules okay rule is access Uh, that i can bring in or failure authentication failures this is the one i wanted remote login failure authentication oh, i can use both add okay okay now i got one thing and when at least three events are seen with the uh, same event properties event properties and different event properties mm, this event property should be this is access allowed this one i know for sure this is access allowed uh, for access authentication allowed and different event in 5 minutes and category is authentication failure match with the same event properties then it should be a uh, trigger so this event property is more net work out want something like a failure in the event just trying with this right now but yeah there are other rules i can trigger with not with the event properties but with other things okay this is how the overall rule looks like but still i am not completely sure that this will work because one thing is that event properties i am not getting triggered properly but i will show you the example of the pre existing rule and we can tweak it accordingly so what i am trying to say it's a and condition not a or condition 
where I'm saying and okay, if when the rule at least three events are seen with the same accesses or related to access control or access successful or a failure and different access for allowed in five minutes after the category definition authentication failures have happened, then you have to match with this particular event property and I can categorize under a particular thing like it's a windows, it's a exploitation, it's a false positive, I can group it under them. So this is how we, you have to use a predefined uh, building block statements and you have to configure a rule for this. But uh, you have to go through the complete thing and then only you know you can get an understanding about how this the building blocks work or the statements is built. So you can create a, a you know, building blocks again separately and you can add it, but this is what we require the main things, the minutes, the timing, the event properties. But yeah, I have a one rule which I can showcase, which is already triggered and wait. Rule name. I'll show you that just in a minute. I'll show it in offenses. We had authentication failure. Okay, since it's not recording, I'll just enable the log activity. I'll start. It's recording. Now let me go into cancel this by entering wrong credentials. So this is my uh, the same account. I'm entering wrong credentials, and I'm trying to uh, unsuccessful. See if you see that as soon as I created unsuccessful attempt, it already triggered it. Here, uh, the date is different, but I'm sorry, but uh, this is just because the system is set on host local host. One second, let me pause this. So if you want to stop a log, you just have to pause it. If you don't pause it, the logs keep on continuously flowing out of the system. So you have a login message, you have a warning message, you have an authentication unsuccessful. I open this. Now there are uh, map event rules, details. I can just go here. So if you see the rules that is triggered, right? The custom rules, it says, wait, is no authentication failure. This is what I have picked up earlier. Now I click on this the rule wizard open up and see the way they have documented this rule. It's not a one statement they have done because I've showed the single statement. If you see when the event trigger or the event is one of the following authentication admin login failure uh, login failed. So this is what they have picked up for so many different scenarios and this is for one successful uh, you know login failures or attacks that has happened. Now apart from this what are the custom rules that is partially applied. Okay, you said like what if I had three events and then one successful event and I want to group them together and make it a rule. This is again done in the same way, taking all the rules together. Multiple login failures from same source. Now if you see when an event matches any of the following authentication and the when the at least 10 events are in the same username in five minutes. Now what I'm doing, I'm customizing this rule and saving it as I want. Now I'm saying my value is you wanted three, right? Or five minutes at uh, three events and within five minutes and again I want one more thing I want to add one more authentication failure successful authentication success this is any of the following category authentication failures uh, any of the following matches Uh, any of the I'll add this again. Any of the following the rule is authentication success. Now, okay. Now I want this rule to go down, so I'll click this. See, now what happened when I have, when event matches, I'm clicking any, I don't want any, I want to keep three of your following events, right? So, hmm. okay, and this is for the count I want. They get it. 
yeah i wanted one successful event severity relevance event Where did it go? In five. Okay, so now if you see, I have quit the entire rule by saying if an event matches any of the following, that is authentication failure, and an event matches any of the following authentication success, and at least three events are seen with the same username in five minutes. Okay, you, if you want to use the same username or multiple username, you can keep because since the password is what they usually change, I have kept it as it is in five minutes. And even manages uh, and when even even matches all of the following rules, then you can create an alert. Or if you want, you can add further statements when at least three events are seen with the same event properties in five minutes. You can still create a trigger. So there is and or or statement. So if you want all of the following rules or any of the following rules. So if you have this, you have a statement and not. That means and not at least three of the events are seen within the same event properties in five minutes. Now if I want uh, not all the rules, if I want any one of the rule to be triggered, it triggers either one of them. That means even if I get a authentication failure, even if I get authentication success, it will get triggered. The reason why I have kept all of the following rules is it has to go step by step. The first thing is failure, second thing is success. At least three events should be there for it and one match should be there for the uh, following rules. So I, I mean all the events should match for it. If not, then at least three events are seen in the same event properties in five minutes and then also you can trigger this rule. So this is how the building blocks are written step by step in terms of creating and this is under the authentication folder uh, which is already kept and you can if you click on finish or next it will show the annotation. Oh, how it is built. Yeah. If you see, it become a statement. If you say there is a parameter test tag is affected, it will say exactly it is there. There are parameters in the test tag which have not been specified. Okay, uh, that is event properties which have not specified. I'll delete this. Let me click on next. Okay, which tag? Okay, I don't want the username. Same account name. Add. Where exactly if I finished any of this and events the following rules. Okay, what rules? Uh, when matches all of the following rules, that is authentication events. So see, this is about false positive, true positive, Windows AD source authentication events, expired account, authentication user changes, success disabled account everything. So I am just trying to capture the definitions and trying to say what event has to happen and what successful or unsuccessful we are trying to match. Yes, this is all. Because until or unless if I don't fill this rule right out, don't I, I don't pick a rule, then it will not work. Okay. Why is taking so much time? Add. Now authentication failure add. 
Now, if I want to see if the account is even disabled, even if it is expired, I want to add all the things that is related to authentication. So what I'm doing by adding so many things, I'm increasing my chances of getting the alert triggered. If any one of these scenarios is triggered in the use case of three under five minutes, I get at least three events of failure and one event of at least success. I still get an event match. Submit. See, added all the things. Now I'm saying at least three events. I need at least four events because I need three successful and successful one successful. I added it. Now let me check on next. I should pick it up. Yes, it triggered. See, now the rule is successful. Now what you have to do is you have to score it. I told you, right, uh, we discussed in the beginning itself. Every rule you create, you need to give it a score. Now you have these options. Relevance, credibility, severity. For your rule, your custom rule, what do you set? Set to, what is the severity for this kind of attack you want to give from 0 to 10? So you have to be very justified under this. You can't name each and every rule as severe because that time magnitude will increase and whenever even a small rule gets triggered, you will get this more and more. This offense create uh, keeps popping up more and more. So you have to be very justified under this. This is a three times unsuccessful, one time successful attempt. So what do you call it? So it's a failure and a successful attempt. So it's authentication. You can name the severity as seven because it's authentication attack. Now the credibility of it. So I told you the example of relevance and credibility when authentication is success or failure. You are not seeing any change in the system, but gaining an access to the system is when you actually get a trigger. So the relevance should be quite high because authentication is success. Now I'm picking that as six. Now the credibility of it. How many logs do you want to get for this kind of an event? I want minimum of four to five events. That means three unsuccessful, one successful. So based on this, I'll say at least I need minimum of three to four logs. I keep the credibility three. So this is what the default score I have set. Now index often based is based on the username. Then you can annotate this offense yourself. If you want to annotate, you have to just describe what are the actions and other things. Then rule response. Now if you see the event details, uh, by default for the rule action, it is so and so. For the category of events that we picked up, the rules we have picked up, it automatically added. Credibility is 7, relevance is 7 and severity is 4. But if you want to change, you can always change this. because Detected multiple 10 authentication failures username under five minutes. Now, if I want to say three. I lost your screen. Hello? You are you able to I see your screen? screen? Okay, Runs sorry. Oh, I don't know when it happened. Are you able to see it now? Yes. Yes, okay. Okay. one second. Ah, see, uh, here we are. So this is after the rule is moved on. Now you are able to work with the rules. But yeah, now you have to score your severity, credibility and relevance. Now I set it to uh, seven and credibility. I need at least four to five logs. Considering four logs, I'll keep it four. And relevance is uh, six I've kept. This is my scoring for this. Now rule response is when, uh, what is the response based on the accumulation we have? Now I said detected multiple three authentication failures for the same username in a five minute period trigger this attack. Or if you say, Three authentication failures and one then oh, sorry authentication success for the same user in a period of five minutes. This is my rule. User login failure and then this information to contribute associated offenses. Now, what kind of uh, alert you want? You want to send to uh, email, you want a notification, how you want. What is the response limiter? That means if a rule gets triggered, within how many minutes do you respond to this event? Everything you can set in this tab, you can click on next and you can finish it. So this is your rule description. What are all the rules you added? What is the difference between the response limiter and the response? Okay. A response limiter will trigger your response for a certain number of period. Okay, for example, right now, uh, respond to more than dash times per second. Okay, now if I say this limit is uh, use the frequency in which you want to this rule to respond. My frequency of this rule to respond not more than 
10 minutes. I mean, it should trigger within that time of period. Even it is multiple case scenario. I want this rule to be triggered within that kind of limited period. Then I have to increase its value and other things. So response is what we do or the, what the tool is suggesting to me. But the limiter is when I say uh, once you reach this limit, I want this information to be passed on immediately. I mean, uh, hope you're able to understand. Uh, should I repeat it again? So will it overlap? So if, if for example, if the rule matches uh, around like 100 times within five minutes, okay, then I will be, I will have only one response will be sent to me because the event is same, but it is happening multiple times. Then I want, I don't want multiple responses to be sent to me like, okay, this is event is happening here, there, everywhere. I just want like if it is happening so on, so many times within an hour period, I just want one event or a one response. In that response, it will show like for how many times this rule has been triggered. So you don't have to get so much of uh, offensive rule, you know, uh, responses or uh, incidents reporting like, okay, you, the same attack is happening around the, on the same system for 10 times or 50 times or 60 times. Even my limit is set for 100 times within one hour, I will get only one alert. I will not get more than that. I will not get 100 alerts for it. That is a limiter purpose. If I say I want not more than 100 times per minute, 60 minute per rule. So here you can click on like you have rule or you have a particular information which rule for which triggering you want this response limiter to be. You can click on that. The reason is quite simple. Understand authentication failure coming into your network. It might be a user behavior. It might be attacker. It might be a lot of things. But if basically speaking, right, okay, let me uh, help you in this uh, example. It will uh, get you the information out properly. Uh, now, I am a user, okay. My first successful login attempt happens at 00, zero unsuccessful login. Okay, I call it un, okay, unsuccessful login is at 01. 10, okay. Now, second alert, unsuccessful login. Zero one. Thirty and third unsuccessful login. Zero one. Now, let me keep it eleven only. Eleven, twelve. So if you see the pattern, what you analyze in this, and I have one more scenario, the same thing. I'll just okay. Now, what is the difference between this and the previous log? Oh, you see a difference. This is the hour and minutes. This is hour, minutes, and seconds. Just give me uh, what is the difference or what analysis you can do from this kind of an alert. Or even it will reduce this much. Now I think you can get an idea. I have reduced the time for seconds for a little bit more. What is the difference between this and this? I think it's a time. Okay. Why I did I, why did I bring this topic is there is a difference between a human behavior versus an automated script attack or a, or a tool attack. Okay. Yes. When a user actually tries to uh, do an unsuccessful login, he will take some yes. time. There is a time gap so that he can enter another password. And there is a gap yeah. again for the third password. And then there is an account lockout after which he will not try to attempt the password until he gets a timeout period. But if it is a script or a machine that is doing this attack on a tool, okay, it will not give that much of time space. It will might happen in point, I mean, like 10, uh, 0, 0, 10, 0, 2 also within gap of two seconds. Again, you might get another, uh, you know, credential issue, the third issue, the fourth issue. It keeps on growing. So there is a difference in analysis between a human behavior versus a machine behavior. 
So when QRR is a tool that is having already this intelligence, feed it from ages and ages, it is able to distinguish between these. Now I set a rule limiter saying that no matter how many unsuccessful attempts I get on a local system, but for all this thing, if the rule triggers for 10 times within five minutes, okay, 10 attempt, 10 logs or 10 rule, uh, you know, unsuccessful login attempt rule is triggered for 10 times under five minutes. I need one. Uh, this thing itself, what do you say? Response is limited as one. I am not getting, I am not considering all the 10 event logs that I would go ahead and see. But if the same rule is triggered for 10 times under five minutes, still my response will be only one. And it also affects your emails, reducing the frequency that you will receive the notification. Imagine so many people, you have like hundreds of systems in the organization. Each and every success, unsuccessful login attempt rule, if it's triggering and it's sending you emails, your mailbox will be already loaded in a day. But you were saying like, if I have so many attacks in a day, you have so many unsuccessful attempts, you uh, and it is happening under five minutes, you give me one alert saying that, okay, there is a unsuccessful login attempt. I'll go ahead and click on it and I'll view it. This kind of login attempts will end because user will end after getting a, a timeout period. But machine will not end. I mean, if it's a script, it will not end until it completely completes its thread of sending the passwords to the system. So always using a response limiter will limit the number of alerts that you get for your email, SMS, or uh, the notification dashboards that you have. Uh, is there any doubt or uh, have I clarified it clearly? Hope, I mean, if it's not satisfied, let me know, please. Yeah, uh, I mean, a, a small question. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I can hear you. Yeah, suppose I don't want to block a geographic location, but after some time of attempts of unsuccessful, I want to block it. I mean, is it, uh, I don't want to do it manually. Mm -hmm. Is it possible? Okay, you want to create a block alert or an IPS kind of alert, right? You want to create a prevention system for it. I suppose uh, any location, uh -huh. what, whatever may be uh, any country, I'm okay. getting an unsuccessful uh, attacks. Okay. Or it's an unsuccessful attempt. So after 10 or 15 attempts, it should okay. block. Okay, you want to create an action also for that rule. We it can block. Create. I mean, yeah, we can create, right? I mean, yes, with, yes. The rule, with the rule, uh, we can, I mean, can we, is it possible for, I mean, to do it uh, manually or you can create see uh, for example you have this rule okay now there is a rule response now one thing is you get notified uh, you get forwarding to destination you can have a different uh, you know these things and there might be uh, uh, custom actions also let me go back for this now i'll delete all this i just want to add for a geolocation right This we will do manually. No, I'm saying, okay, when the source is located, this geographic location, it'll take an example and then you want to add a custom action for it. Now I'm choosing India only, let me add it. Okay, and then what you have to do as an action. Okay. One second, but uh, let me get that for you. Give me a minute. Oh, there is one option which I can execute a custom action for it for if the rule gets triggered or this offense is getting triggered. Okay. Because if this tool has the feature of, of blocking a particular asset. If the connectors are DSMs are there, it can block. If it does not have it, then it have to be a manual task. Because, uh, you know, this is not a feature integrated with the firewall that it will go ahead and block or create that rule. You can only target the device and let you know. Unless or until we don't have that option, uh, it's very difficult. Let me check. So you mean to say only the destination part will block? I mean, I cannot block the whole country. You can block it. The reason I'm saying is that the SIM is about event monitoring. 
it does not give you prevention or it give you other additional features like blocking until you don't have an agent deployed on that system for example your public firewall is what it's taking the hit from right and those logs are forwarded to your sim now if you want to block that either you need to have an agent or this agent has to be working along with your uh, firewall to trigger that rule no actually uh, just to sorry to interrupt okay. works like when you create the rule it mm -hmm. just give you the notification it it will not block anything correct because i'm saying because saying, saying this offense is you need to notify to your firewall administrator ki you see traffic from correct. the uh, location which is not suspected and on the firewall you can block the traffic correct it just notify you that's it oh okay because there are some sim tools that have come up with like karun black is one of them with ips i have worked on something called sinet 360 that is agent based that means each and every system will have its own agent through agent you can block it but that is not there in ibm q radar i mean that's what i meant if the sim solution comes up with their have the has their own agent which can do this functionality only then it will work else it will just give you alerts and you have to respond that's why incident response team is required right if the machine can do that then there's no need for incident response team it can take care of that also strong is not same as curada yes yes but that is only available in certain sims not all so is, is, is uh, can we create some custom rule for a specific like uh, if, if the, there is a requirement like if my event actor or my event processor is going down it should mm -hmm. send a notification uh, on to me on a system notification mm -hmm. like processor is not reporting or the ecs ingress service is stop so mm -hmm. how should i create a custom rule for that okay uh, so there is certain you know uh, specific skill set required for writing a entire, uh, entire custom rule so what happens is basically the existing rules are created based on the pre existing set of uh, rules that has been already there in the ibm q radar so leveraging that they write this custom rules that's why ibm provides additional functionality such as such as xforce and app exchange where you can download the rules that you require for your organization that will work for you and you can enable those rules which is required example now you have something called aws instance right if you see uh, there are rules already ibm partners have written for it from aws and other things the rules particularly written for I, aws environment now all you have to do is this you have to download this add it onto your Q, ibm q radar from that location machine you just have to in, integrate it and in that you can enable which rule you want and which rule you want to disable and you can customize that so you will not get a complete set of freedom to write the rules but you have the option to download it from a third party and install in your q radar but but again like this is this might be not a good solution to every rule you should download like a uh, app because again it will create a performance issue on my curator if i keep on installing the app right but see you want uh, the complexity is i'm saying you can disable the rules which you don't want okay if i if in the rules okay if i if i have something like groups right in the rules if i see there is uh, quite a lot of things that i want to add i want to delete or i want to disable so it's quite difficult for me to manage if i want to write one particular rule for it or one activity that i want to create or one offense that i want to target and i want to write a rule for it then i have to work towards it manually and i have to write with source ip address so this is all based on network protocols but if you say you have an ip address can you I have I a source name machine name then you can add it can i not create a reference set and call the reference set into the rule example if i have blacklisted ip or uh -huh. the like blacklisted user names mm -hmm. from the geography can i can i not add that in the reference set and call that reference set in a rule is that possible okay see you can use the i i said from the beginning you can use always the existing rules or new rules that you write as reference for other rules 
that is not a restriction at all but how do you write it with the predefined building blocks is the question with the uh, this you know the logs that we are getting or the rules that is getting tri uh, triggered it's not Can that I ask one more question yes please okay let's say you have a list uh, for critical hosts and then you want to determine a scan mm -hmm. so how do i add a list here or you want to whitelist a certain administrator from the let's say it's escalation of privileges and then you don't want to report if a certain administrator escalating the privileges but you want to escalate if one administrator is not on the list so how do you put the list on the on curator okay see uh, you're asking two set of questions over here the one thing is that you don't want to alert certain things which you can trigger or you can disable the rule okay because you there are certain rules which you don't have to enable or create you can disable them i can i can you know go through that and which rules are enabled which rules are not enabled and based on that the event counts will happen or it will flow okay second of all if you want to say certain thing is a false positive there is something called false positive which you can click on it and you can say you don't have to alert it but if you want to alert certain things particularly to an administrator or something like that only you can create an exceptional rule for it to forward that emails to an administrator and not in the system because if i click on something if i say false positive it will not report that uh, again at all for me uh, that rule will be completely null, uh, you know nullified if okay. it is coming into the system but you want to forward to administrator that is fine it will come as a, in the alert in the system and it will get triggered to the respective person whom you are adding in the uh, alert notification okay so how to put the list let's say if you have a, a certain list you want to put okay list. okay uh, let me add that so for example now i take a similar one now this is a list of things but we have quick filters now you have a list of activities per se or ip addresses now authentication is something like we have already tried in last uh, i think it's 5 minutes okay i have information message and i have an error let me check this now if i click on this it will give me a reason and ask the question so one sec
യഥാർത്ഥ ആസ് സ്പ്ലങ്ക് ഈസ് സെയിം ആസ് ക്യൂരഡാർ ഇറ്റ്സ് സിമിലർ ടു ക്യൂരഡാർ ബട്ട് നോട്ട് സെയിം ആസ് ക്യൂരഡാർ ഈച്ച് യുനോ എസ് ഐ എം ഹാസ് ഇറ്റ്സ് ഓൺ സ്പെസിഫിക്കേഷൻസ് ഓൺ ക്വാളിറ്റീസ് ഓൺ സെറ്റ് ഓഫ് തിങ്സ് സോ ദ ഫംഗ്ഷണാലിറ്റീസ് മൈറ്റ് ഡിഫർ ദസ് ദ റീസൺ ഐ സെഡ് ലൈക് ദർ ഇസ് വൺ മോർ ടൂൾ കോൾഡ് സോളാർ വിൻഡ്സ് ഇഫ് യു സീ ദ റൂൾസ് ഇയർ ഇറ്റ്സ് വെരി വെരി സിമ്പിൾ ബട്ട് ഇറ്റ് ഡസ് നോട്ട് ഹാവ് ഇൻ്റലിജൻസ് ഓഫ് എ ക്യൂരഡാർ സോ ദറ്റ് ഇറ്റ് കൻ ഡിറ്റക്ട് എവ്രിതിങ് സോ ഇഫ് യു സീ ദ റൂൾസ് ഇയർ ഇറ്റ്സ് വെരി വെരി ബേസിക് വെരി വെരി ഈസി വെരി വെരി അണ്ടർസ്റ്റാൻഡിങ് തിങ് where you can just add uh, the certain in you know tabs and the rules get generated automatically so for example here one of the things which was enabled was uh, okay see if there is a create rule create rule from an existing template if i create rule from an existing template it just picks up what rules i want i just need to add and it just picks up automatically like i am saying login failure okay see account log on failure or uh, log on failure within intervene uh, windows log on failure so for example if i want to take a windows log on failure with inference or without inference i just have to click on this uh, i click on next automatically i'll get the default rule that is windows and the whole rule occurs in less than 10 seconds in a 5 minute window then extension account is failure this creates a rule this is solar winds but your curator is not as simple as this you have to dig through that you have a huge list of statements then only you can do that in curator so this is a difference between a simple solar winds and a curator again here it's quite simple you can pick an event you can pick an event group uh you can just click on add and keep adding multiple things and you can create so many rules with a simple understanding statement but see the curator is quite complex that's how it works so splunk might be different from this splunk not be as uh, easy as what i'm seeing right now over here so like uh, yes for a list of events that i want to create i have added the filters right now if you see uh, for adding filters i picked up login message and uh, i wanted to have the source ip address and the login messages to be nullified or false positive that's how i wanted to save it now if i want to save this i just have to create this false positive so that i won't get any alerts for this particular rule now if you say event flow property event flow specific id uh, that is this particular id we want to block that or you want traffic direction that you have to block any traffic from this ip address to this ip address the local system alerts any event that is happening in this local system alert or anything that is stored here i want to just cancel it out because i don't want any activity that is happening on a local system or if i want anything that is happening from any destination do i want to you know uh, false positive it i don't want that i just want this thing if i click on tune it right i will have all these events turned out to be false positives it will not be coming as an alert anymore but what i can do is such alerts again i can create a separate rule so that i can get notified i'll show you how so now i create false positive for this uh, flow uh, for the specific q id or q radar uh, id on which the rule is getting triggered now i got it as false positive now i'll go to this rule but see it's already a false positive i don't have to redo it because it's already mentioned over that this is a false positive activity and I have closed it so i did it overview on uh, by through the filter but again i'll just show you can do it inside also this q id again is the same i am just blocking anything that is happening on this particular uh, ip address and once i do this the next thing what i have to do is i need to create a action that means if i want a alert to be sent out for this rules how would i ensure that i get an alert even though it's a false positive only for an administrator or somebody like that so it's scroll down and... yes please yeah why the source and the destination ip is the same it's a local machine okay the example right now since we are working on vm right uh, so this is a vm on which we are actually functioning so if the source uh, the password on which machine i'm entering and it's giving me a failure that means authentication is happening on the local machine but if i have a destination port from where the authentication is being tried uh, that means it is from a remote system and i can block any communication to the remote system or uh, sorry not blocking but any communication apart from the local system to any other destination ip address i can enable it but it's still enabled it's not false positive 
if i create that as a false positive i will not get any alert for any communication or any login failures or login messages from this system to any other system so that's how the rules work you can remove the rules that is happening uh, create a rule for avoiding all the alerts you are getting on a, on the same machine so that you are not worried about it it might be a typical user failure but if it is having some destination port or destination ip address through which it is communicating and getting these log on failures then you can trigger that event and you will still be having those logs anyways and you can reduce the amount of logs that you are getting over a period of time hope uh, i mean hope i answered that question i mean am i clear for it hello 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 guys yes okay hope yes we can uh, hear you yeah yeah no i just wanted to check whether uh, the doubt is clarified because it's happening on a local machine hence the ip address is same the source and destination is same yeah okay, okay but fine. the but my my question i'm not sure if you still remember when i was asking where can i add the list uh, show me that one no the list i am saying right so when you go to log activity you can pick number of rules and you can turn them into false positive or you can reduce them as alerts so for that you need to get the list of logs you have to filter them out by filtering uh, filtering them all out you can create them as a false positive category so i am saying list of events is based on queue ids no. if i say log on yeah go ahead yeah tell me uh, uh, sorry sorry I, i'm not sure if you understand my question what i'm mm -hmm. saying is that let's say you have a list of a critical host so you want a, a, a let's say if you see a, a certain ip address trying to scan those hosts then you, you must receive an alert so when you are adding okay. the list let's say you have the own list and then you want to add it on the scene you can add it i'm saying you right you have to play around with the rules yourself that's when you become perfect but i'm saying again you work on uh, it's a free tool that is there is uh, solar winds the reason why i'm emphasizing to use this is learning rules is much easier in this compared to qradar once you make yourself perfect in this understanding qradar is not much difficult because qradar gives you so many options the mind gets confused or boggled up like what all things should i add or delete it's there in qradar i can repeat it because it was there all from the beginning itself i can just give, take you a walk through of it i can go to the rules i can show you like what rule or if you want to add source port or source ip address destination ip address everything is already predefined building block statements in qradar now if you see i want to go to actions new event rule i want to create okay you want a particular host right so you have the one of the ip is one of the following ip addresses that means any one of the following ip addresses also is getting scanned you want to get an alert you can add all the that host ip address but what if you don't have an ip address like you want a host name or something like that okay what what i was asking is like let's say a client is a critical host let's say they are asking you to report on this host only on this host so how do you add the host that you have given yes to the ip address i'm saying right so here you want the host name or the ip address like which one you want to pick depends on that now if you want to add the ip address click on it add as many ip address as you want it's not you know it's not saying that you have to create this rule only for one ip address you can add as many ip addresses oh. as you need oh okay i see now you, you can add 10 ip address 20 ip addresses it's up to you and if you want the ip address and the destination ip address also to be the same or it's a different ip address on which you have to get this triggered you can add a destination ip address so this is a destination ip address one you just have to click on that block now you have one of the following ip addresses per se i have three ip address into 168 1.1 okay next 192 168 1.2 192 1 One dot three. So I have three IP addresses added for the source. I'm adding all the three. 
and destination is one of the following which is the destination you can add so if you have any communication between the ip address 1.4 and uh, 1.2 dot uh, all the three 1 2 1 3 and the four ip address number four is trying to communicate or establish a connection between them then you get an alert triggered for it i'm saying right because uh, the reason you get confused we you have to go through these building block statements you have to understand like uh, the rule wizard again i'll give you a link which is helpful for you to creating these rules understanding these rules over a period of time so this is the link uh, okay how to detect deviations how to create rules how to create rules based on offense based on events this is very very resourceful i mean ibm also has it in the ibm knowledge base but i would suggest this because this would be very much uh, helpful for you to go through understand how these rules work in a basic functionality uh, please share the link yeah, yeah i did i shared it and I'm again saying like if you are feeling like IBM Curada rules is a bit difficult task, try SolarWind rules. It's very, very easy. You learn this, you can work on any other tool as well. Because understanding the rule statements is quite easy. The statements here are quite simple, but the statements here are quite complex in the Curada. So that's a major difference that you are seeing here. So here I have to click on each and everything. I have to arrange the rules. I have to look at the you know statements properly, and then I have to add it. So that's the main you know uh, building block thing that I have to check. Now you have remote work locations with the source IPs from new remote network locations, geographic locations, everything. You have a statement defined by IBM for each and everything. That's a rule uh, wizard. That that's what it uh, helps us in building it. That is for a particular rule on a. event level now the same rule you have a common rule you want to create you want to create an offense rule you can still create a lot of offense rules as well so if see now there is a custom rule detected like intrusion detection detected by the local system now I click on it automatically the rule shows what are the events they have added see they just added two things and when the event category of the event is one of the following exploit exploit means it can be anything there are so many exploits just by single adding state adding a single statement you are able to get the overview of everything. So I'm saying like it's not complex, but it looks complex. That's it. You have to understand, get a hang of this uh, statements. Now, if somebody is saying they are doing a recon, okay, they are doing a recon on the system. This anomaly execution. I'm going through that rule. Now, if you see how much of statements I have added, and it's not and it's a and not when an event matches any of the following definitions that means here earlier we are saying if the event happens in this way trigger an event now they are saying if these rules are not triggered then also you will have to trigger an event okay if the event matches any of the does not match any of the following and many of the acls of firewall or switch with the same source ip more than 100 times across more than 100 destination ip within five minutes trigger me an alert and what they have said firewall accepts across multiple hosts more than 100 events were detected across 100 unique destination ip addresses this is the reason why we go for predefined rules on IBM App Exchange because uh, if you have the expertise to write these statements and it works well, that's well and good. If not, you have technicians who are working on it. Every product, even Cisco, it might be AWS, Azure, they are, are actually providing support by providing the rules for their environment provided in the Q radar. All you have to do is download and install, and you get those rules. And if you don't want that rule, you can exclude. If you want that rule, you can include. Uh, see, you are paying IBM Curator is a very costly tool. You are paying so much of money because of the support they are giving and the IBM Exchange, Exchange platform, the threat intelligence platform. But uh, if you are not leveraging that feature and if you want to write these rules on your own, I'm I'm happy that if you can you can try the rules on your own. But you need to first understand all the statements that is there in the rule wizard and how to bring it in and make it into a proper statement. Simple rules are easy to create. You want to block a geolocation, you want to monitor three IP addresses, 10 IP addresses, you want to maintain 100 ports, you want to create alerts for them, it's fine. But how do you convert a physical or a use case or a reality use case into this? That's the whole point. Understood?
Steven is asking me how to create building blocks. Uh, Steven, creating building blocks is from IBM itself. It's a support feature. So you can't write the custom statements on your own, which the machine does not understand. So you have to follow the building blocks to write or define the rules in its own way. The problem is, if you write any rule in a different way, the machine just doesn't understand uh, how to analyze or how to read that rule and how to trigger it. Uh, I can't see your screen. Sorry, I'm actually sharing the screen. Let me stop it and reshare it. I've stopped the screen. Let me share it back. I have one question. Yes. Yeah, so I have heard that mm -hmm. there is something called normalization in this QRODAR, like when you receive your logs, which are not readable by machine or humans, mm -hmm. convert them into the readable format. Is there any procedure like that in this tool or is it, it's just normal formality? I just need to know. OK, like I'll uh, see it, it's normalized events, nothing but uh, the tool is able to understand the logs of multiple source like Windows sends its events and logs in its own format and uh, the Linux machine sends the sys logs and it has a predefined set of format. So it can pick up the basic information from those logs and it can, you know, say what things uh, it can understand or what things it is identified. For example, keywords like IP address, ports, uh, this source IP, destination IP, source port, destination port, host name, uh, geolocation. These things are normally understood by the QRadar. That's one of the special special specialities that it has because it works on different platforms and it is able to read logs of different, uh, you know, uh, what you call sources. But the problem is creating a rule is nothing but IBM's own platform, its own their uh, technology and patented way that it has to be created. If somebody wants to create a rule for QRadar and launch it, they can, but it has to go through QRadar's approval and only then it will be launched in IBM App Exchange. It's just like a Play Store. So normalization is nothing but understanding the events that is happening by basic feature it has that QRadar has evolved over time. It can still understand it. But it, it is it based on a keyword. It's not like it reads the entire text, but it goes through a particular keywords or filters that we use. Something like a uh, IP, something like a port, or uh, the numbers, a series of numbers with four, four dots in between. This is like the intelligence it has to it has to understand that. Okay, okay. Uh, if you see, that's the reason why they always uh, you know, uh, keep the price of this uh, in so much price or else QRadar will not be usually with so much of cost to the company compared to other tools in the market. So if you click on normalized option, it automatically understands. IPv4 will have four dots, IPv6 will have six dots. So it's it's based on the, again, it's not normalized when it will read, but it is already been coded, hard coded into it. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Okay, I see a text message. One second. I'm trying to get the QRadar cloud version so I can showcase that. The screen is disappeared again. I'm not sure if it's on my side only. Pardon me? I'm saying I can't see your screen. Actually, I'm trying to log in. Uh, I'm adding the credentials. That's the reason I just stopped the screen. Oh, okay, no problem. 
Okay, I'm trying getting it. So the for the session, right? We actually are using the IBM Curadar cloud also as a part of it, and it's a, a cloud version. And anybody, if you are interested to go ahead and use a Curadar cloud version, it's there for 14 days free trial. You can use that, and we basically use that also for training and uh, education purposes. There's no restriction. So if, if you want to get a hang of Curadar, you can go ahead, play around with the rules, understand it, and try it out. So that's totally fine. So sharing the screen because I don't know why cloud is taking more time than on premise one. Log. OK. So if you see like uh, there are a list of logs that we have created and uh, for your own study purposes, right? For education purpose, if you want to understand how the logs get generated, created, what rules can be added into this? What are the rules already getting triggered? You want to understand, right? You can always go to the experience center also, and you can try to run a simulator and the threat simulator will generate the logs that is required for you. And those logs you can review and understand. Uh, for example, from different geographies, this is one interesting log that I wanted to uh, check that. Uh, cancel. I just close experience center. Now if you see, uh, they have a magnitude with the severity 10 because same AWS account, Cloud account has logged into multiple. This is a real time scenario. Now you have annotations, details, and everything. Now I want to understand how this log or summary has happened, how many events have contributed to this event, how it has happened. Oh, so if I go for this event, if you see 12,946 events have contributed for this offense. And each and every event has its own rules for triggering and closure and other things. So we can check that offensive rules that is triggered over here. If you see like how from different location, which which country it is starting from, from where exactly it has been identified. So virtual machine creation attempt on done on AWS. Now if I click on this, I'll get to know the you know the rules and the details of it. Now, see how many rules got triggered for this? AP has been invoked from Kali. Uh, detected a massive creation of EC2 instances. Weight is low. So this one, so many rules got triggered to contribute to particular one offense. Now, if I want to check the information about EC2 instance getting created on a massive scale, I click on the rule wizard, then each rule you will know. So this is all nested. So you have events uh, for, for looking at these events, you create a rule and all these rules combined together, uh, you get an offense. So it's in that way. Now for a simple rule of getting AWS account created, if you see they have clearly mentioned. And when the event were detected one or more experience AWS this log at the rate IP address. So they have clearly mentioned and when the QID is one of the. Uh, so this QID is nothing but you have to get for uh, from the Q radar itself. You'll get the QID for each and every uh, rule or an event so you can get that. And when at least 100 events are in the same within the log source in two minutes, if 100 events get generated and then the event matches experience uh, center uh, custom any of AWS cloud, then you get it. So if you see this, they have mentioned the IP address. So I'll show you where exactly they called it out. So they have created here. They mentioned this AWS experience center, AWS syslog at the rate so and so IP address. So this is a predefined rule set they have added into this system and it's actually already detecting. And if you want to define it customly and you can go ahead and edit this rule or you can create a new rule and then you can go with the building blocks that it already has. So whatever they have written, created, everything is through the building blocks itself, nothing out of it.
and if you go next it will show what is the credibility severity how they have measured and scored this if you see here they have enabled everything to 10 and then if you come down they have added this information uh, event detail severity 10 credibility 10 relevance 10 and then annotate uh, this experience center and here you can choose you can use a response limiter which they have not chosen and then you can click on finish to finish up the rule so this is how custom rules are written and triggered for your reference you can always go back and check the previous rules that is written analyze it and try to write your own rule and for various scenarios as i said if you are not getting enough logs in it enough events in it you can go to the experience center generate as logs as many events or as many offenses as you want and then go through all of those things it will work so this is already predefined set of offenses security events generated by ibm for the research purposes and understanding the logs how it works how they have configured how they have written it so if i go to admin again as i said if you don't want to use by ibm app exchange it's completely up to you but if you want to use it i would definitely recommend to go ahead and use it depending on your uh, uh, you know organization or so if i want to go on extension management i have one qradar rule already downloaded on my system let me try to bring in that now i click on add so here if you see uh, cve mitra is not added i'm clicking on add uh, i want to browse mm. The downloads CVE. So, this is a Linux pack XML file. Sorry. Okay. So, if you see, this is the zip file. I'll open this. And I'll click on install immediately and I'll add. Same way you get the rules for GDPR, you get for AWS, you get for Azure, you get for everything. Now, once I've installed this rules, okay, uh, it takes only a few minutes and then I have one option called deploy changes. You have to do that whenever you apply a new package or new rule. So this one I got from IBM App Exchange. I'll show that also. And uh, here's the CVE Linux Mitre. See, this is the one I have downloaded. And this gives me information who is the author of this, uh, you know, uh, rules. When did they approve this? When it was uploaded, approved? And did the QRDR give approval for publishing it? And what all the rules and events you would get through this? And you will get all the information. Credential access, lateral movements, privilege escalations, all this information will be tracked through this if for example your organization is more concerned about gdpr you have rules written for gdpr already written on the qradar you just have to download that see content extensions for qradar you have to click on it download it and use it it says what all things it can check data transfers size limits and uh, personal data origin data retention processing activities and uh, reporting on the gdpr personal data servers where they are located you just have to add this package to QRadar and let it work. Now it's done. Now I have to say, click on deploy changes. I'm deploying all the changes. Okay, now it's done. Now I have to go to the groups and check uh, whether my, uh, you know, rules or the package has been updated. Now I go to this option. One sec. And a uh, few of them ask like whether I need all the rules. Uh, should I need all the rules or should I can I block all the rules or do you want to install everything? So once you click on this extension, right, you have a groups place where all these rules are there. If you don't want it, you can delete it or you can disable it or you can use it when it is required. Waiting for the completion. 
else you will not get this in the yeah I go to groups and in this group, if I don't get Linux Mitre, that means it's not added yet. So if you see in the L, uh, the Linux Mitre is not added. Yeah, here it is. It's getting added. So whatever is installing right there. Where is it? Done. Installed. Now I go back. So these are the rules that has been added for me and uh, what are the user accounts that has to get no action required for which activities and okay for example you don't want anything that is particular to you that is for only linux you want uh, adjust everything you want to add everything you want amazon aws thing also you just have to enable assign those groups add it done it gets added for that also. So similarly you have for Amazon AWS also. Again, you get the CV Mitre here. It got added to multiple groups. So for Linux issues, whatever I had, I tried to move a rule into Amazon AWS and use it. And if you don't want anything, click on it. You try to uh, edit, change, copy or create a new group. Make your custom groups based on what you require. Let me stop these alerts since it's going from long time. OK. So that's about uh, groups, rules uh, and configurations and other things. Now I think last question somebody asked was like uh, architecture. So uh, how many of you have heard about something called a golden architecture? I want a paint 3D to do it. And no, one minute, I'll just stop the screen for a while so that I can uh, get the download of the golden architecture diagram. Any other question amongst these guys? Sorry, my voice is a bit low because I'm continuously talking. <coughs> Sorry, uh, tell me yeah, any other questions in this? Yeah, no question for uh, creating rules. Uh, we can you can go ahead for architecture. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have stored it and my personal device, I'm just downloading it.
So uh, before, anyways, uh, before going that, I just wanted to confirm. Most of you are working in the organization, right? So, you know, how is your current architecture? Is it a segmented uh, with the proper network segmentation and segregation, or it's without uh, any segregation? It's a flat network. Like, how do you come across in your organization that you have seen so far? So I can give an overview like why uh, the architecture is properly has to be designed from the very beginning and how it has to be good. And anybody just give me uh, information. Yeah, I have a distributed network. OK. That I have a master console. Mm. I have a master console in uh, one of the region called Japan. Okay. One event processor HA in Japan. One okay. processor in US and China, Ching, Singapore, uh, Malaysia, mm -hmm. and all Australia, New Zealand. I have a different different event collector has been set up. Okay. So the event collectors for now, if I want to say typically you set up different event collectors, but uh, where exactly do you store them? Uh, I mean, like, do you deploy the event collectors on all the systems or only certain systems or only particular network events that you're capturing or everything? No, uh, on a, see, on a region, I have installed the event collector, which mm -hmm. will collect from each of the region and it will send it to my event processor in the US. Okay. But how do you identify? I mean, uh, the, the main question was like, uh, how do you recognize? OK, for these systems, I want to you know you are collecting or aggregating logs in one particular location and then spreading it across or uh, you know installing the agent on it or you are having the connectors deployed on critical systems alone. Oh, see, event collector is not an agent component, right? It's a DM. Event Hello, sorry. Event Hello. Event collector is a is a collection engine like a like right. a event collector a box or the right. or on the virtual app which collect the logs from your endpoints and send right. it to the event processor for right. creation and it's processing. Log storage area. Yes, so right. it doesn't do anything. It just collects and forward. It's a store and forward option. No, uh, that, that's right. But are you collecting for all the systems or only particular systems? All the system those that is on the region. Okay, that's that's the thing. Uh, that's a confusion. Just wanted to uh, eliminate. Okay, I'm sharing the screen so that it becomes easier for approaching. Okay, hope you are able to screen the screen right. So this is a PCI scoping approach which I'm taking, which is called as uh, I know what we typically call it as a golden architecture, right? So if you take any uh, environment example, you have a public facing network and a private facing that is internal network. So in PCI and other things, we call something called critical call order environment, but it is applicable for all the critical resources. Then comes the devices that support those critical devices, something like you have an application server, but for that application server is internal. Then you have a web server that is external in the DMZ zone. OK, now what happens? You have an internal network again to protect. If you have 200 uh, uh, servers and 1000 systems in your company and you have eight uh, uh, what you call switches and four firewalls and a router and everything, the number of logs generated per, the, per second, we call it logs per second and events per second EPS, which will increase and overwhelm, overwhelm the storage capacity for log analysis because it's quite a huge amount of log and we are not sure how much of logs can be collected or how much we can limit or how we can design the architecture to ensure that log analysis can be easy and the storage is also minimal. So what we are trying to do is we are not saying that we will collect each and every log that comes out of the system from every system that we have. But that is the reason we have the alternate supporters or some systems we can integrate with the SIM machines. Example, your antivirus logs. So your antivirus already generates certain logs which you can integrate. You have AD, you have AD logs which you can get integrated. You have Microsoft security event logs, not the complete logs of the Microsoft Windows security event. Again, for Linux, you don't have such categories. You have sys logs. Network, you have sys logs again. 
So when you get so many logs, so much of events, again, you have uh, now firewalls will have IDS, IPS systems, you have DLP solutions and DLP in, on the host and you have DLP on the email servers and have uh, Outlook also comes with its email security logs. So now you are getting logs from so much of sources, but how do you configure or make sure your SIM gets what it wants and only get the right information when it's required for you to assess or access it? So that is the whole point of configuring or uh, having a SIEM architecture designed and defined so that you get the logs which is most required, reduce the number of space and increase the capability of the SIEM machine to analyze it faster. Now because of this, they have categorized into three machines. One is the critical systems, which is your core systems for the business. Second thing is supporting systems, that is your uh, patch servers, your SI, uh, your antivirus servers, and your AAD servers. These are all supporting servers. And the category three are those non-critical systems, which do not interact with your critical systems directly, but their only way of communication is through your category two, or the supporting systems, which manages both critical and non-critical environment. That's the whole diagram. Uh, to showcase this in a typical way, if you see, DMZ is public facing, so it's completely occupied, like your FTP, web server, e-commerce, email, everything is public facing, they put it under DMZ zone. Now your internal server form where you have application server, database server, file server, those comes under your internal form server. Again, to balance these two, you have something called, uh, I'll, I'll take the uh, you know highlighter just to ensure. Mm -hmm. Okay, you have internal firewall, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. You have internal firewall, you have, uh, sorry, external firewall, you have internal firewall, and you have something called wireless, and you have a router. Now, among these, uh, from where all or which all systems do you feel that the logs are important? I mean, from which points we can aggregate or collect the logs and which we can eliminate? Tell me, for, I mean, I'm asking in random, if you want to ensure that these are the so many systems that you have, what are logs would you, would you get? Okay, I'll mark this is Windows, OS, endpoints. Windows, uh, servers, public. Windows, servers, internal. Routers and switches, firewalls, antivirus, DLP, email, again you have uh, Linux OS, Mac OS, Windows OS, uh, sorry, not Windows, Linux servers. Now, apart from all these things, again, you have cloud environment, which is separately managed and handled. Now, if you want to design an architecture and uh, give an overview of installing QRadar and configuring or getting the events onto your, uh, you know, the event processor or the log storage area, and then you want to process it and find out the events. You have so many sources from where you get events generated each and every second in the organization. So what do you think are the core critical points from which you can get the logs first to act upon? Or the entry and exit points. So for my organization or network, my only source of entry is through my firewall and the exit is through firewall. And if I have any other system such as VPNs configured well and good, if not, if I allow my endpoints to communicate to the internet directly, that means again, it's a major risk. Now, whatever happens on my endpoint also should get notified to me. So how do you ensure that in your QRadar or in your systems, uh, these things are taken care and handled? So that's the reason we follow something called golden architecture principle to ensure first you have to segment and identify your critical assets and resources, which is public facing, which is prior, uh, internal facing. And among them, which is your public firewall, which is your internal firewall. 
and on your systems what are other technology solutions do you have because adding too many connectors to your sim also slows it down because it ha it cannot handle too much of information or it, uh, it can cause more cost to the company so that's why you have to keep these things in mind while designing an architecture so what i'll do i'll get the firewall logs which is very much important for me so that my both internal and external firewall logs are getting monitored that's one thing now in my network the most important servers i do have is my application server database server and file server where my data is stored or managed but you have other lot of different servers to do the same task but it is not critical you try to eliminate as much as possible if not you want it still okay you have endpoints with the user account names and you want to work with the username details and accounts you have ad logs which can generate generated you can integrate the ad logs directly for user account as successful and failure but again you have an endpoint logs in endpoint again you have to target and filter out what kind of logs you want to fetch how much you want to fetch for which network so the best thing to do is club that network you have a list of linux machines put them under one network or if you are having one particular division like a, something like a finance team admin team uh, you have it team you club them under one network group and among that network group you try to monitor the logs or the activities that is happening which are core and critical but if you enable collecting the logs for everything and then moving it and storing it maybe per day even 5 gb won't be enough for an organization size of 1000 or 2000 employees if we get so much of information per day so we have to always think about minimizing the risk minimizing the size improving the efficiency and designing the connectors appropriately from where exactly the logs are getting pulled up and stored now if you have the log collectors and log processors now log processor is one thing where your logs get sent but how much of log will you send to it because you might get charged for the space if you are increasing you are in cloud again you get more charge because you are using more space and you are using more resources to go through those logs because applying filters identifying those events it quite difficult so uh, hope you understood this architecture like how you have to config how you to think when you are configuring or adding an sim solution what all things you have to keep in mind so this is the configuration architecture apart from this uh, is this the question that you asked about sim architecture or you want to know like how sim is de designed or you know uh, added because sim has its own architecture as well how it works how it uh, you know performs how it's configured all those things actually wanted to understand the sim architecture okay. and components how it works like where because if someone asks where the eps get utilized so we should know the EP, eps is utilization is gets where it's on the ep or on the ec where we when we where we insert the license so how actually the eps is cal calculated how the processor or the uh, event collector works what is collecting how collecting works that detail we need into the architecture oh, okay got it understood let me you know, get that information I think I had gone through this before, so not a problem. Not this. This is the one. I'll share this link. This is also which you can refer. So this is the QRadar architecture when it was you know, properly defined. So we got to go from the bottom, that is from the point one. Okay. 
so for event data, if you see there is log source from firewall, which I was saying, log source from Unix and servers, which is again this log, which I said, and log source from proxy servers and Windows servers. Now again, you have other data, which is from Curada Risk Manager, packet capture for forensic and scan data, witnesses, all those things you can still get. Now what happens is the first thing is your event collector and flow collector and passing the normalization. That means you collect all the information and you send the information to the data processing where you have event processor and flow processor where exactly your data storage and custom rules get triggered. And third thing is your data searches or the graph reports, alerts and your dashboard where this is actually you know showing the entire information, how it works, how it operates and how the information is flowing within the QRadar and how exactly it actually manages all these components and other things. So uh, the, this is where exactly the basic architecture of QRadar is dependent on and how it is configured and managed. I'll take you through other things as well. And give me a minute. Now if I go for QRadar components, okay. Now we have collect EPS collector which is event collector. Now event collector is nothing but it collects event from your local or remote log sources and normalizes raw log source events to format them for use by QRadar. So as I said, now you have keywords and other things for different log sources have different statements. Windows has its own statement set of logs. Linux has its sys logs. Your Cisco uh, will give a logs in a different format. Now using those keywords of IP source, destination, all these things, QRadar understands the things in its own way, in its own statement, and it normalizes according to under QRadar understandable format. Uh, it might be XML also because I have one of the rules written in XML format. So understanding that, it sends it to the event collector uh, for or coalesces identical events to converse, conserve system usage and sends the data into event processor. Now, first thing is that event collector is taking all this information and passing it to collector and collector. Like coalescing is nothing but bundling, as I said, like. Uh, correlation is nothing but you have multiple events with a similar type. You bundle them together and make it one. Uh, so getting those identical events and trying to conserve the storage space is why we use coalescing for. Uh, there's not much to it. It's just a simple technique to understand and maintain like you have one event which I showed earlier. Like it will show like it's a, if it's the same event, uh, how many times has it been repeated? That's nothing but coalescing. There exactly, did I get it? Okay. So if you see like uh, event count one, but if I really had it coalescing, uh, you know, enabled or something like that, it would have showed me same log, multiple events, like event count would be 20 or 30 or 40. It would have combined together instead of sending me uh, collecting the logs from different sources and saying like you have 10 logs, you'd have said one log has been repeated 10 times. That's how it would have been if it has been done with the coalescing option. That's why we have to enable that. There is a coalescing thing. For this QID, they have not coalesced. So then it's giving me this information in an individual option. Else if you combine all of them together, it will give just me one information, one log, how many times it is repeated. So that's nothing but coalescing. Then apart from this, you have event processor, which is your events per second license. As I said, event collector is nothing but your uh, number of events. The events is just collected and sent to it. And to process it, you have EPS, that is events per second, which you have to write. If you coalesce, as I said, it will reduce 10 events. It's just sending as a single log file. So that is where you get the major advantage of reducing the log storage space. Then you have queue flow character. Is nothing but connecting your uh, the information to flow across the IBM uh, storage and to the uh, routers and gets the information. But uh, 
for this one, to be honest, like installing a Q radar flow collect, Q flow collector on the hardware, this have not completely worked upon all the uh, flow collector pipelines or processors or data node or hap host. The reason is quite simple because when I was, uh, you know, into Q radar, it's just a dashboard as a security analyst we would see and the logs we collect. Remaining information we analyze, we get through it, we understand through working with the, you know, Q radar cloud version. But for complete information about event processing, flow collecting, uh, configuration of QRadar onto different platforms and how to set up the entire architecture, that information I need some time to get through it because uh, my the, the entire assessment for the QRadar is where till the rules are configured and managed. But to have this, I should be an SIM architecture or an entire security architecture to have hands-on experience on implementing these things because whatever I have got so far, is I could uh, you know just communicate or share it with you. So this information particularly, I can clearly say that I have not really wo have worked hands on these things at all. But I would need some time if you want that information, I can get through with the right people. Coalescing means uh, is it related to aggregation? Yeah, coalescing is nothing but like as I said, right? You have ten events that is on the system, right? Now you are getting the uh, system. Invalid login attempts for 10 to 50 times. You are getting 50 logs. Now, what I said is, I said one log and say that event count is 50. Okay. I won't send 50 logs to the system because it takes more 50. Uh, if I take 1 KB per log, it will take 50 KB of space. Now, I'll say only 1 KB of file and I say the count is 50, it will reduce my space. But my uh, the number is looks quite simple, but if you think for over a period of time of one month for all the organization events, that's more like uh, you know saving a lot of space. I have one question. Mm -hmm. So uh, some people who are in, right now not working in uh, cyber security or SOC monitoring who are trying to convert into the SOC monitoring uh, platform, mm -hmm. uh, someone from networking or a desktop support level. So what are the basic uh, concepts or uh, sectors on which you know organization uh, they uh, they expect that some uh, if I'm a hiring a fresher to work on a curator basically which factors that we need to perfect in order to get an interview or clear an interview okay uh, so for your question Right. For if somebody wants to work in SIM uh, solution, I want to get through this. SIM has various roles. Okay, SIM analyst, then incident response, then we have something called uh, SIM architect. But before going to SIM architect roles, they will be working on something called admin or engineer, security engineer. Uh, and other things. So these are the core roles of a SIM, uh, you know, uh, field in the within the SIM field. Now, what does an SIM analyst do? Okay, SIM analyst basically does the activities of monitoring, identifying incidents, threat hunting. That means if the intelligence is not sufficient, he manually goes through the logs to identify if there are any events by applying the queries and filters for it. And he will do the reporting for any uh, reporting of, okay, then false positive elimination, elimination of false positives. False positives and fine tuning the SIM. So his job is only to monitor, identify incidents, report incidents, threat hunting, elimination of false positives and fine tuning the SIM for better alerts and reports. Uh, because if you know, the vent clients report that is a false positive, they have to reduce that. Uh, they have to enable it as a eliminate them from, from the future reports. Now, incident response person is not a person who sits under the monitoring. He will do complete incident response planning where after getting an alert from SIM analyst, what he will do is he'll do a analysis investigation. So here, if you say the first thing is that once they get an incident, uh, the response for the incident response plan is about identification, containment. So first thing is not 
uh, remediation guys it's containment only first he has to contain the incident or he has to block the ip address he has to block the uh, you know uh, eliminate or isolate the system from the network if it is compromised so that's the first task containment remediation then it's analysis and investigation this combined together and response and then lessons learned and other things will come up like how did the event happen uh, where it happened so for this incident response they typically follow something called incident response plan which is common across the industry So no matter which profile they work, which designation they are in, incident response plan is always the same. The right image that you have to follow is on these ones. This is not giving me not respond recover. If something says detect and respond, don't believe that because containment is the first one. It's not about responding is the, uh, the next option. Yeah, this is the NIST diagram. So it's a preparation that is your SIM detection analysis is what your SIM does and a level one analyst does or security analyst does. The containment eradication and recovery is the thing and the post incident activity is about your lessons learned and all those activities will come into the picture. So this is what typically all the organizations will follow no matter uh, you know uh, which which team they belong to which level they belong to this is the same. You have to prepare you have to detect after detecting the containment and eradication recovery is what the incident response team and post incident activity will they perform now coming to the last part of the role that is your si marketer or engineering he is the one who actually configures manages and uh, also sets up uh, what do you say uh, this one billing and architecture design so these people are more like consultants uh, and engineers they know to configure sim solutions they know to deploy it they know to manage it they know to fine tune it and they know how to troubleshoot it so these people will take care of the architecture and design of it so the role is split across these three but if you see in LinkedIn and all, sometimes they might ask all the three because that's a random HR uh, thing they would ask. But the roles are segregated properly in SIM. The person who does architecture, he can't do the analyst role or he might be from the analyst background, but he still knows it. But he can't be efficient architect if he does not know the complete detailed uh, information about SIM solution. Example, in certain companies, if you go as an SIM analyst, right, they have all the three tools, uh, Curadar, ArcSight and uh, Splunk. Now understand you can't perform all the roles and you can't work on all the tools. So if he is an SIM analyst, he can work on all the SIM solutions because monitoring is quite the same activity, but he has to know the different uh, commands, different functions of each and every SIM tool to understand and to uh, analyze the logs in it. Okay, just like I showed you SolarWinds, I showed you QRadar. These are two tools. Now you have more tools. So the activity is same, but the uh, tools are different. Now incident response for him also it doesn't matter which uh, platform is working on but his core skills will be about uh, having a forensic knowledge knowing the uh, right sources or from the VAPT background to identify the uh, you know system that is affected contain it forensic investigation has to be done uh, identify how many systems are affected in the system run a query across the organization try to find out the level of impact or data breach if anything has happened or any data is left the organization are there any uh, you know, uh, what do you say? Uh, what do you say? The rogue programs installed on the systems or rootkits from which actually the uh, attack is still happening. Those are incident response. And architect, as I told, is about configuration management. Uh, like they are also skilled in multiple tools. So a person who is from IBM, he is expert in QRadar. Guy from HP is from Archisite. But if you go for some consultants outside, they are thorough with all the three tools. They can configure and provide you installation of uh, Splunk. They can provide you configuration of and um, configure uh, QRadar and uh, SIM as well. But if you are a fresher, you're going first thing. The basic thing is network knowledge for all of this is quite mandatory. Having a VAPT knowledge is additional because uh, there are courses like ECSA, uh, but that one is only about security analyst. It will not give you complete knowledge. If you go for VAPT, you will know how the attack happens. 
uh, how an attack is prevented, how the defensive controls are placed, what is the functionality of those defensive controls, which you cannot understand in a network level because in a CCNA network or any other networking codes or knowledge, you will understand about how source or uh, how the packets work, how the network works, how the firewall works. But understanding all the technical controls you have, you need to understand the VAPT concepts thoroughly. What is the offensive and defensive controls for it? Once you know that, then you are thorough with two things. Now, the incident response is where it's more focused on your forensic knowledge or analyzing an incident, digging through it, identifying it and containing it. So it's more of forensic knowledge is little bit required, but VAPT knowledge is again sufficient for it. Architects, for these architects, they have to know the tool of a SIM analyst as a basic thing. Other thing is there should be a certified professional who knows to configure those systems. If you say you are a Splunk certified engineer, that means you should be knowing how to deploy Splunk and configure it and uh, you know, manage it. But usually what happens is third party companies will come and do the deployment and they will give you the access for monitoring. Same thing happens for uh, SIM. You will have just the connectors you just have to deploy or you have to have a single uh, log source from where you have actually the event processing happens. We just have to send the event collectors out. These are the things they would manage. It depends on the role or designation which they are asking in a uh, job, what their exactly requirement is. So based on that, I would recommend if you are in the industry, not in the industry, be thorough with the VAPT concepts, be thorough with the uh, network concepts and you should be knowing about how this uh, log incident response happens. This simple thing, incident response plan, how it works. In case of an incident, how do you contain the situation? How to manage the situation? and how to handle it or post incident activity there are those things thanks i'm okay. already thorough with networking concepts vapt is pending i'll go on for mm -hmm. now you can understand that vapt and forensic knowledge which will give you a major boost for incident response and sim both thanks for explaining the, the good way the different different roles thank you for that welcome if you want any time, you can go to Naukri or LinkedIn. Uh, you can reach me out in LinkedIn as well. But if you see the roles, they clearly specify that like it's an analyst role or an engineer role or an architect role. Based on that, you can vouch for or you can join for a job. Yeah, so just wanted to know, are we done with today's course? Yes, yes, we are done. We are done. So the, uh, when we will be doing the incident response and incident handling? So actually, I wanted to complete the incident response today itself because incident response is nothing but a series of activities that you have to uh, perform. OK, so what actually happens in incident response? If you have a bit of time, I'll complete it in 15 minutes if that's fine. OK, so but I wanted to understand the full life because that life is cycle. a role which I'm performing soon. So I wanted to understand in a very like deep manner how actually okay. the works and all that so if we can plan a session next time is okay we can go to the response incident response and incident handling both so it will it, it will help okay okay let me check with them because basic incident life cycle is like i'll tell you then you if you want an elaborate class i'll talk to the you know, management and see if we can have another session for that okay okay because so, we have the we have the course going on so i think it will cover in that there it's also incident handling incidents we are already registered for the course for the curator so in that there is a topic yeah you're right uh, we are expecting more on incident response uh, the policy documentation uh, plans and even checklists a lot of things need to be discussed which is there in the on your portfolio Yeah, yeah, that's right. Because if we don't know that, how we will handle the incident? Yeah, you're right. Because nowadays there are many roles coming out. If you see the job, they are mainly asking for the incident manager or incident response manager. So we need to know the inside out how actually if we how actually it works. No problem because see, uh, since I came to came in today for the session, I was not aware of the pending activities. So that's the reason I said if you have any pending activities, you can let me know and I will handle it. So I'll talk to the management. If you want like incident response and management is one thing and you need a checklist and activities list of things that has to be done in an SIM role. 
these two things i have noted anything else if you want we'll arrange in the next session no that that is the only thing like mainly the incident response and incident handling uh, if you can arrange one more session with us of two hours that will be a great with the management approved uh, yeah sure sure we'll do it get we get on the net as well what are the checklist yeah. No, I'll take you through that because see, uh, even having a checklist, it, it's easier to say like, you know, I'll give the checklist and you go through it, but it's not fair from my end because internet response plan requires a different set of mindset. Uh, that time you have to think more like a police inspector because if an incident happens, you have to be thorough and prepared because see, a uh, security analyst will just raise an incident ticket and they'll tell you like, okay, I found an incident, go through it. Now, how do you handle in terms of whether it's a estimate incident or not? It's a false positive. If it is a estimate activity and in terms, sometimes if you see that it's a ransomware attack, like you know, without panicking, how to stay cool and how to still handle the situation, how to go through the steps one by one. What is a you know containment situation? What is the eradication method? Uh, what is a series of steps that you have to follow? All those things will completely take you through that. Not an issue. Yeah, the reason I ask because when we like I'm working with one of the MNC. So uh -huh. when we define a solution or like when we design a plan, they also ask for the incident response plan. How, how right. if the occurs, how, how will be the flow? So that's the, because I haven't worked on the incident response, so I have a bit weak in that part. No problem. See that one uh, organization also has to develop a document called incident response plan or incident response management. They have to define that plan. In that plan, they have to set up a series of activities like uh, incident identification, date and time and all those things they have to capture. Then what is the core issue? So whenever there is an incident, there is these things is common. The root cause analysis that has to be done. But the actions taken during an incident, like you have a response plan, right? You have to go step by step. OK, you have identified, detected. Now you contain the situation. First thing you ask them to is to identify the IP address and try to, uh, you know, make sure that IP address is not connected with any other system in the network. You isolate it. Then you perform your activities to identify what is the destination IP address from where the attack is happening. You can block that. You can ensure that furthermore, any other systems is affected. Is it communicating to that IP address? So there is two and for communication. There's ingress and egress. That means ingress is something where the attack is coming from and egress is somewhere the information is flowing out of the network. You have to identify both the points because every time it is not the same IP address where uh, the attack comes from and the data is moved out from. It will be different. So you have to think in that way and you have to identify what are the list of checks you have performed for that incident. Like, okay, you have checked the system, you have checked the file, you know, whether the you run the antivirus scans, you have made sure there is no rogue files on the system. You have scanned the network to ensure this IP address is blocked, whether you are getting any alert, any other alerts. Do you